In this video, let's talk about Apple Devices Wi-Fi roaming strategy. Here on the screen, I show you two articles from Apple. The left one is about iPhone and iPad. The right one for macOS. As you can see, I highlighted the statement from Apple. So for iPhone and iPad, the trigger threshold for the device to roam is lower than minus 70 dBm. And in the right, similar statement, but the number is a little bit lower. It's minus 75 dBm. In fact, this video is the second one in the series. I strongly recommend you to watch my first video, the introduction one, so that you will know the context for this particular video. And because in my previous video, I already discussed the iPad roaming, so I will focus on Mac OS in this video. This is my lab environment. I have two access points from Ubiquiti. I will handhold a MacBook Pro and move from this place, which is close to this U6 Enterprise AP, move to this U6 Lite AP. I will try to test whether the trigger threshold is what Apple's document described. When I move the laptop with me, the Wi-Fi signal strength from this source AP will become lower and lower and the ones from the U6 Lite, the target AP, will be stronger and stronger, right? So at some point, this laptop will roam to the new AP. To capture all the Wi-Fi frames during the process, I will hold another Apple laptop with me, run sniffer on it, so that I can capture all the Wi-Fi frames from beginning to the end. So I want to know whether this question mark dbm whether it's really minus 75 dbm as we discussed in the first video i show you two circles in different colors for the two access points they are both for the minus 75 dbm signal strength i make sure they have a overlapping area just to represent a typical wi-fi environment and because I'm going to use Sniffer to capture the frames, and later I will run Wireshark to show you the result. Just for your convenience, I also note down the MAC address for the two access points and the MAC machine, so that we can easily tell what's the source and the destination in the captured Wi-Fi frames. In the second part of this video, to make things more interesting, I will introduce another access point. The new one will have almost the same signal strength, but use different channel width. Let's see whether it will have any impact to the roaming. We will discuss some other very interesting things which are related to the Apple device roaming. For example, the neighborhood report, different Wi-Fi standard, whether they have anything to do with the roaming results. Okay. A lot of things to cover. Let's get started. In Unified Network Controller, go to Settings for Wi-Fi SSID. I have this one set up. It's using all the access points. I manually only enabled 5G Hz Wi-Fi band just to make the Wi-Fi frame capturing easier and the roaming process simpler. And I disabled all the fast roaming settings. That's it in the SSID part. Then let's go to the individual access point. For example, example this U6 Enterprise under the 5G Hertz radio as you can see I manually set a channel by the way to simplify the Wi-Fi frames capturing I forced the channel to be the same on the access points used in this video. In real world scenario, of course, it's not recommended, but this won't change the conclusion of this video and it will dramatically simplify my Wi-Fi frame capturing. So that's why I'm doing that. Another thing I want to mention is the minimum RSSI setting. I make sure I enable it and I set it to minus 80 so that when the roaming happens, we will exclude the factor that, okay, the Apple laptop is kicked out by the AP due to the minimum RSSI setting. So for the other AP, I make the same setting. So I won't show you. As you can see now, the MacBook 
Pro is connected to this U6 Enterprise. I am ready to start the first testing. Keep in mind, I'm also going to capture the Wi-Fi frames using another laptop at the same time so that later we can do some more in-depth analysis using Wireshark. Now I'm holding the MacBook Pro, standing pretty close to the first access point, the U6 Enterprise. On the lower right part of the screen, you can see the Wi-Fi man and it's showing the real-time signal strength. I just started moving away from the first access point towards the second one. As you can see, the signal strength is dropping, still pretty good. So let's see what will happen later. Already lower than minus 70, but it's still not roaming. That's expected because it's not iPhone. So the trigger threshold is different. Okay, now it's below 75. It just roamed, as you can see from the upper part of the screen from Unify Network Controller. Now it's connected to the U6 light. You can see the roaming happens at minus 76. As Apple stated in the documentation, the threshold seems to be minus 75. We just confirmed that. Here on the screen, I show you the captured frames using Wireshark. Before we explore the captured frames, let's talk about the MAC addresses here first. In the past, for the desktop version of Unify Network Controller, it did display the BSSID for the SSID you defined. But for some reason, Unify removed the feature. Only when you run the mobile version on your phone, you can still find out the BSSID. But it's not a big deal because you can still easily find it out by SSH into the AP. Let me briefly show you. IWconfig and this ATH2 is for this SSID and is for 5G, right? See what's the MAC address or BSSID is showing here. That's what I noted down here for U6 Enterprise. Let's go back to the Wireshark window. Even though I only recorded less than one minute, the file is super big already. So we must use some filters to narrow down the displayed frames so that we can find the ones we are interested in. First, let me filter using EAPOL, which means I only want to see the four-way handshakes. I only see one occurrence of four-way handshakes. You can see the four frames captured here, right? Which means during the whole process, the Apple laptop only authenticated into one AP. That makes sense because it needs to authenticate to the new AP. If you check the time column, you can see it happens at about 32 seconds. Now if I change the filter to this one, basically I'm saying I only want to see the frames sent or received by the Apple laptop. So you can see a lot of frames. If we scroll down to the 32 second part, so see this four red frames, they are the four-way handshakes we just saw, right? Before that, that's the normal authentication and reassociation frames nothing interesting. Slightly before that, you see this light blue frames. They are probe request and the probe response. Remember the video I show you about the roaming? At this moment, the Wi-Fi signals just dropped under the threshold, minus 75 dBm. That's why the Apple laptop sent out the probe request. See who responded? This one from the MAC address ended with B6. Who's B6? Yes, this new AP, U6 Lite. And you can also see the response from MAC address ended with A8, which is for the original AP, the U6 Enterprise. Both APs responded. Just from the probe response, the Apple laptop can tell the RSSI signal strength and apparently selected this new AP and roamed into it. So that explains what happened before the roaming. So the Apple laptop sent out the probe request and then the new AP responded. Then why the Apple laptop sent out the probe request? Because the signal strength just dropped under minus 75. 
See, I just filter the frames using this new filter. Basically, I'm saying I want to see all the probe requests sent from the Apple laptop. See how many frames I got? Only one. So during the one minute process, the Apple laptop only sent out one probe request. I believe now the whole process is clear already. However, there's another interesting thing we want to investigate, the neighborhood report. So here on the screen, I show you another Apple support document about different Wi-Fi standard and their relationships with roaming. One thing I want to discuss here is the 802.11k neighborhood report. If you are interested, you can read the Wikipedia article about this standard. It works in a very simple way. AP will notify the mobile device about the Wi-Fi situation. Situation. Then when mobile device needs to roam, it can directly utilize the information provided by AP through the neighborhood report so that it will save some time during roaming. It sounds like 11K report should play a role in the testing we just did, right? But let's validate whether is really the case. Where is the 11K neighborhood report in our captured wireless frames? So let's go back to Wireshark. Now let me use a new filter, which is action code equals to 4. 4 means action request and 5 means action response. They are both about 11K neighborhood report. First, show you the action code 4. During the one minute process, there is one and only one request. And it's from 7F, it's for the Mac machine. What's the destination? B6 is the new AP, the U6 Lite. The Apple machine did send one request to the new AP asking about neighborhood report. Let me add another condition so that we can see all the requests and the response okay the second frame this is the one responded by the ap this is the neighborhood report itself if you scroll down to the very last section tag neighborhood report it's very simple for this particular testing scenario because we only have two ap's this particular neighborhood report was sent from the U6 Lite. It only include one BSS ID and the C was the BSS ID. It ends with A8. That's the U6 Enterprise. This is what the neighborhood report includes. It includes the Wi-Fi environment, which is known by this AP, and this AP will notify the laptop. Of course, the neighborhood report doesn't include the source AP itself because this AP is already connected with this Apple device. This Apple device knows everything about this AP, right? So this AP only needs to notify the Apple laptop the things it may not know. In our particular case, this neighborhood includes and only includes the information about the U6 enterprise. In the future, if the Apple laptop needs to roam, it may save some time because it doesn't need to scan the network to find out the candidate AP. It can directly ask from this AP about its capability, its signal strength, right? So it doesn't need to scan to find out this AP anymore. That's the purpose of this neighborhood report. Okay, but you know what? That's not really the most interesting thing here. What we really want to know is the timing. So when the neighborhood report, the 11K, when it happens, did it happen before the roaming or after the roaming? Only after understanding the timing, we can understand what's the role the 11K, the neighborhood report, plays in the whole roaming process. How we can find out the timing? See this column for timing? It happens at about 32 seconds. Let me switch back the filter to the ones which limit the frames from 
or to the Apple laptop. Now let's scroll down to the 32 seconds point. This one, which is still highlighted, is the neighborhood report itself. See when it happened? It happened after the roaming. See these four red frames? They are the ones we already saw. They are the handshakes. And see these frames? They are the probe response. And they are the authentication frames, right? So basically, the 11K communications, the neighborhood reports, only happened after the roaming and only happened once during the one minute. So then you may ask, then what's the point of the neighborhood report, right? Think about it. If in the future, the laptop needs to roam to another AP again, at that time, the already received neighborhood report will play a role. It will help the laptop. Before moving on to our next testing, there's one thing I want to mention here. See this Apple article we discussed earlier? It mentioned one a little bit confusing sentence. If the target BSS ID, if it's 12 dB stronger, it will select the new one. No really clear context about this statement. There are multiple ways to interpret it. For example, it may mean even though your current connected AP, the RSS ID is not very bad, it's still higher than minus 75. If at the same time you have another AP which has much stronger signal, it's 12 dB stronger, Mac OS will still roam to the new AP. That's one way to interpret it. But at least that's not the way I observe. A second way to interpret is Apple put this statement under this section. This section talk about the preference about different Wi-Fi standard, different channel ways, right? So maybe Apple means if they do have two candidate access points, theoretically macOS prefers one, but if the other one has much better signal, 12 dB better, Apple will still choose the bad technology, old technology one just because it has higher signal. And the third way to interpret it is even if your current signal is worse than minus 75 dB, if your new candidate AP, the signal is not really 12 dB stronger, macOS will still stick to the original AP without the roaming. To be honest, I don't know the answer how to interpret this statement. If you know, please let me know in the comments. Now let's talk about our second testing. We just talked about the trigger threshold. There are other factors which may impact the roaming for macOS. Apple listed several things here. For example, it prefers Wi-Fi 6 over Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 5 over Wi-Fi 4. It prefers 80 megahertz channel width over 40 over 20. I'm only using U6 access points from Ubiquiti. They all support Wi-Fi 6. So I don't have a way to test this part, the preference about Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 5 or Wi-Fi 4. But but I can do something about the channel width preference part. In this slide, you can see I add another access point for the U6 Enterprise and U6 Lite. They still use the 80 MHz channel width, but for the new U6 Pro, I chose the 40 MHz on purpose. So then I will try to make sure these two access points in the left, U6 Pro and U6 Lite, they have the same RSSI at this point when the Mac machine moves to this location. I will see which access point this Mac machine will roam to, whether it's the 40 MHz one or the 80 MHz one. I decided to use a Android app on cell phone, try to find the exact location where the U6 Enterprise signal strength will drop to under minus 75. At the same time, the U6 Lite and U6 Pro will have the same signal strength. I'm trying very hard to find that location. Fast forward. 
Okay, now it's under minor 75. And the signal strengths from U6 Lite and U6 Pro are almost the same. The U6 Pro one is even a little bit stronger. So we can proceed with the second testing. By the way, you may already notice this testing environment is not very scientifically prepared. For example, the Android cell phones signal situation might not be exactly the same when I do the testing for my MacBook and when I handhold my MacBook, I cannot guarantee I will exactly reproduce the situation you just saw I measured using the Android phone, right? So basically, the second testing is just trying to give you some idea. Don't take it too seriously. Okay, I'm starting the second testing. As you can see from the Unified Network Controller, I have the MacBook Pro connected to U6 Enterprise. By the way, ignore the MacBook Air. It has nothing to do with this testing. So now I'm moving very slowly from the U6 Enterprise to the U6 Lite and U6 Pro. Let's see which access point the MacBook Pro will roam to. Okay, you can see it roams to U6 Lite. It confirmed what Apple says in the documentation. Just because U6 Lite has 80 MHz channel width, MacBook Pro prefer U6 Lite, even though it has the same signal strength as the U6 Pro. Now let's examine the captured Wi-Fi frames to understand what really happened under the hood. Let me find out when the neighborhood report was requested. I made this filter to only see the action code equals to 4 and 5, which means neighborhood report request and the response. Okay, only two frames are included. The first one from 7F to B6 so from the Mac machine to U6 Lite. And then the response was from U6 Lite back to Apple machine. It makes sense, right? And the timing, it was at about 21 seconds. Then let me filter on the frames from or to the Apple machine. Okay, then scroll to about 21 seconds. This is when the neighborhood report was requested and received. If you scroll up a little bit, it happened right after the roaming because I see the authentication, then the four-way handshakes. It's exactly the same behavior in the first testing which is right after the roaming was successful. The very first thing the Mac machine did was to request neighborhood report from the new access point. Let's see before the roaming what the Mac machine did. See here, the Mac machine sent out a broadcasting request. It was a probe request asking information about this SSID. And then it received multiple responses. BB was from U6 Pro, B6 from U6 Lite, A8 was from U6 Enterprise. So the Mac machine did receive responses from all the three access points. And then, based on the situation at that time, as we already observed, the Mac machine selected the U6 Lite and roamed to it. The exact same situation as we saw in the very first testing. So the neighborhood report was only requested after the successful roaming, and it may help for next roaming. Then the very last thing, we want to check for this video is for this particular testing, we have three access points involved. Let's see what's really included in the neighborhood report. Let me highlight this frame. This is neighborhood report response itself. See, there are two texts about neighborhood report. The first report is about the A8 access point which was for the U6 Enterprise. Then what's the second neighborhood report? Yes, it was about BB. It is for U6 Pro. So now everything's clear. The Mac machine reached out to the U6 Lite, which was the new AP, right? Asking about neighborhood report. And the U6 Lite responded with one frame, including two neighborhood reports, each one for one AP. That's 
how the three access points behaved in this particular three AP roaming. Okay, this is the end of the video. I hope it helps you understand how Mac OS Wi-Fi roaming works. Thanks for watching.